Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX Colloquium. Welcome to the people in the NILSI and to the people online. I always turn around to see other people online, but the camera is in front of me. I don't know. The brain works in funny ways. Yeah. So the, uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I'm the director of, of, of NITEX. And today we have a, a very interesting talk by Professor Heidi Prozeski. Heidi is a sociologist by training, yeah, from what I <laughs> learned recently, yeah, at least a PhD, but she's affiliated uh, with CREST, our own Center for Research on Evaluation, Science and Technology, and I think luckily I can read it off because I don't know if I could have remember all the acronyms, and with, um, and with the related uh, DS DSI and RF Center of Excellence in Scientometrics, yeah. And uh, over the years, Heidi has worked a lot on issues related to gender and postdocs and human resources in general in, uh, in academia, specializing on postdocs, uh, at least in recent times. Yeah? And today, um, she will speak about that. Now, recently, she published a very nice article in the South African Journal of Science on the topic. That, uh, and when I saw it, I thought that could be... <laughs> the topic of a nice NITEX colloquium. Yeah? So Heidi, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. And um, yeah, we are very keen to listen to your talk. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. Um, again, I just want to say um, it's a great pleasure to share my work. It was gratifying to know that the hard sciences, physics, computer science, take note of um, our work in the social sciences. And um, I hope today that I can show you what we're busy with um, and an overview, not too much detail, but I am going to talk quite a lot because we're planning to publish what I'm showing you today as a book. Um, so this is a, a project that I've been um, the BI of for the last uh, four, maybe even five years lost track of time. And uh, it's just taking us into new areas as we analyze more and more data. Um, so my first point would be, what is a postdoc? Obviously, we need to define, if we're scientists, what we are talking about. Again, as always, in the social sciences, it's quite difficult to define what um, a postdoc is. Um, this is the most, uh, I would say, common Definition, the most used definition in the literature, which is from the American University's Committee on Postdoctoral Education. It's already a definition that's quite old, but it gives us an idea of what the postdoc is. Recent award of a PhD, that recent is obviously something that uh, differs from context to context and over time, but it's usually considered at least five years. Uh, be in a temporary position, so it's not a permanent position. Research or scholarship should be the main focus of a postdoc position. It, would all, it should adequately prepare the incumbent um, for a full-time career in academia or a research career maybe outside of academia. It requires a supervision of a senior scholar. In South Africa, sometimes we uh, refer to that as the host, the individual person in a department that is supervising the um, postdoc. But um, elsewhere, uh, the term supervisor is also used. So I hope that doesn't create too much confusion. And the appointee must be provided with sufficient freedom and support to publish the results of his or her research or scholarship. Freedom and support to publish. And uh, we're going to look at many of these aspects of postdocs. Um, when did postdocs become a thing? Well, Macaulay and Wendell, in their very good chapter on the history and evolution of the postdoctoral scholar in the United States, say it's unclear exactly when the postdoc first became institutionalized, but it obviously was after, some time after, they say, the first doctor of philosophy degrees were granted in Germany in the mid-17th century. Just to give you an idea, South Africa first introduced postdocs at universities in the late 1990. 
1990s, according to Wieland Gevers, who was the driving force behind that at UCT. So we are a little bit of latecomers in South Africa when it, when it comes to postdocs. But our Department of Science and Innovation, previously Science and Technology, also DHET, Higher Education and Training, and the NRF have said a few things about postdocs since the late 1990s. And I did a quick policy discourse analysis and found that it started with the idea that postdocs will give you a competitive edge as a country, but also postdocs individually get a competitive edge from doing um, postdoctoral training. And it's uh, that the word internationally comes in there to establish themselves internationally and to promote internationally competitive research. Move on a few years later, uh, probably around 2008, we start seeing a more local focus. Building research capacity in academia became the focus of the postdoc, especially among designated groups. So after the PhD, the postdoc, uh, women and black postdocs especially, were then considered to be the next generation of academics in South Africa. Later, things started getting a little bit difficult in academia. We created a lot of PhDs, or we didn't create them, we uh, invited them, and we struggled with supervisory capacity. And the postdoc is framed then as augmenting this supervisory capacity, also for master students. So we saw an increase in enrollments um, of students, postgraduate students and postdocs were supposed to then assist in that. And it's assist in increasing output undefined, probably research output, but could also be output of post, uh, 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 postgraduate students it's because established researchers output is considered insufficient. This was around about 2016. So we can see how the postdoc has become from something like an internationally competitive um, scholar to somebody who's assisting a system that is under strain. So my presentation will focus quite a lot on the content of the South African Journal of Science article, trends in the number and profile of postdocs. So I think probably about half of the presentation will be dedicated to that. Um, I am also going to present some new data that I literally still was crunching on Saturday. So it's fresh off the Excel sheet, as fresh as you can get. And then I will look at um, the results of a survey we conducted, which we did not publish in that article. We were still busy analyzing the data at that stage, looking at various aspects of postdocs experiences, um, their prior career trajectories, why they take a postdoc position, funding, they are bringing a little bit of extra data from the NRF as well, conditions of service, publication output, we saw the definition of a postdoc is they need to publish, they need to get have the freedom and the support to publish, how much do they publish, supervision of students, are they supposed to supervise students and if so, do they want to? an assessment of the position as a whole and of the supervisor, and then the future, their careers, their plans for their careers and migration, are they going to leave South Africa? Just quickly on data sources, for the South African Journal of Science article and for some other aspects of this presentation, I drew on the R&D surveys that are conducted annually by SESTI at the HSRC. We also use HEMIS data, High Education Management Information System data. We have the funding data from the NRF for the last few years. I also look at policy documents and get some figures from those. We collected data from institutions. Unfortunately, five did not respond. So we asked them uh, about their postdocs, uh, gender, age, race, et cetera. Then, as I mentioned, there was a national survey of the postdocs themselves and their the experiences. From my inbox, were sent 2,260 invitations to join this or to participate in the survey. And um, so we have around about 500 or a 21% response rate, uh, 500 responses that we can analyze. Um, I think relatively 
uh, representative of the postdoc population in South Africa. It's a nice high response rate compared to what we usually get in um, surveys of academics. So I think postdocs really wanted to talk. And I say that also because although the survey questionnaire was mostly structured, as, as we always do, we included a question at the end just to make sure we captured everything. And we said, if you've got anything else to say, please do. And it was amazing how much we got in response to that single question. At least 241 responses, sentences, paragraphs. They really wrote quite a lot about their feelings. Obviously, one has to uh, be concerned about how representative those qualitative data are, because the more people are unhappy, the more they would write. But I also try and bring in some of that qualitative data in this presentation. And not, not enough time to give you the, uh, the quotations, maybe one or two, but um, just uh, to show you how uh, they feed into our recommendations as well. On top of that, we did a bibliometric study just to define the output of postdocs and to measure it. Um, we use Web of Science, the microdata, we have that at Crest, and SA Knowledge Base, which contains the subsidized publications of universities as submitted to the DHET, but we only focus on articles. All right, so trends in the number and profile of postdocs. I focus mostly on the past 15 years and I focus on the higher education sector, universities. And this is the one graph that was in the article as well, but I've added the last two years figures. And as we can see, there has been a relatively steep increase of postdocs year on year from 2007 to 2021. We have some a few little data pieces we could pick up for 1999, where we had approximately 300 postdocs. It is reported, and then just a few more in 2003. But from then on, it really took off. What's interesting to me is that when it was really when the increase was really steep, which is around 2010 to 2019, it's 143 percent from the one year to, to the last year, from the first year to the last year. I'm always nervous when I do mathematics <laughs> in a situation such as this. Um, I could find for exactly that same period for two countries only, comparable data, and I worked out the percentages, and it was scary how similar they were. Finland and China had very similar percentages, completely different numbers. China's numbers are 10 times that of South Africa, of course. Finland is, 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 is almost similar, but um, it was interesting. Postdocs in, in South Africa have not grown necessarily at a much higher rate than at least two other countries in the world. We need to get more data from other countries, um, but uh, people are not doing this kind of research. I also just want to highlight the last few years, the last four years or so, there's been a, a slight downturn in the trend. It's as if, as you can see, it's now below the trend line. So um, we've e even saw a little dip from 2017 to 2018, the first time ever that we saw a negative growth, and then uh, a little bit up again. So there is something uh, that is going on here that seems to slow down the accelerated growth that we've seen uh, from 2010 to, to 2019. Then I said, but we need to have some relative measurements. We need to control and 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 wait. Maybe the my wait, waiting is probably not the right word, but we need to take into account other factors. First of all, how many um, PhD qualified researchers are there in the university system, and how many postdocs are there in comparison? So that's what I did, and um, what you can see then is that we started off in 2008 with 10% of the postdocs, uh, the postdocs representing 10% of all PhD qualified researchers in the higher education system. The 90% is made up of the others that are in permanent and contract positions, but are not postdocs, but they staff. And we increase, we see an increase up to 2015. So again, this trend, up to 2015, um, 2015 is the highest, 21%. And then we start seeing again a decrease in the 
percentage that postdocs represent at our universities amongst PhD qualified researchers. Um, we also use another measure called FD, research FTEs as percentages of um, headcounts. It's a measure of time spent on research. And we have three categories here of comparing the PhD students with postdocs and with researchers. The researchers are at the bottom, hanging around 20% of their time. The, the, the proverbial one in five days are spent on research. It's always been that way. And I think the managers always wanted to be a little bit more than that. And then the PhD students hanging around 50% up to 57%, very, very stable across, um, across the years. And the postdocs are much higher than that. All right, these are subjective measures uh, that man managerial staff at universities fill in and give to the give to SESTI and the HSRC. But it still shows you that, according to them at least, postdocs spend most of their time on research. Take that off the definition of what a postdoc is. In South Africa, that seems to be the case. Some of you might wonder, why are PhDs spending so little time on research? What else are they doing? I would just like to remind you that the majority, 60% of PhDs in South Africa study part-time. So they're working, they're in employment. All right. So to interpret this, we need to go and look at two um, main theoretical frameworks, academic capitalism and resource dependence theory, which together tell us that we have increased competition among universities for public funds. This is on a global scale, but also, also on a national scale. And especially the subsidy funding in South Africa is something that universities are competing for because they are becoming increasingly dependent also on external sources of funding and funding that they can get from performing not block funding. Postdocs cost relatively little and therefore give them a competitive advantage. The more postdocs you have, the more you publish, the more subsidy is coming in. And you have leverage as a university over postdocs. They're not protected by legislation, so they don't give you headaches about that. And there's no long-term commitment. So it's a way to increase your research output and maybe even other functions of your university's academic sector. A supply of surplus supply of labor. Um, and because of an increase in PhD graduates and an inadequate labor market demand for these skills, especially in the business sector, we end up with something called credential inflation. A PhD is not the PhD it was. It's not worth what it was 30 years ago. Um, and now these days, if you don't have a postdoc, you only have a PhD, you don't have that competitive advantage. Um, oh, if you only have a PhD, you don't have the competitive advantage. So now it's PhD plus postdoc, and then you can only get into a position that is uh, credential inflation. By chronological age and analysis here of just the institutional data, that's the 21 universities that provided us with those data, shows something concerning. And that is that we have an aging of the postdocs. We're in 2016, 19% of them were in the 21 to 30 age group where we would expect them, maybe also of, we expect them most in that second one in their 30s. Um, we, we see a decrease in that percentage and an increase in the 41 to 50s and even the older than 50 postdoc group. I will talk about this at the end, although I also want to mention postdocs are then for me, maybe a canary in the coal mine telling me that we have casualization of academic labor increasingly. So that's not only a problem for the individual postdocs who need to deal with um, one postdoc after another and having no security, no job security, but it also means a potential loss of knowledge for the national system of innovation itself. They switch from one contract to another, so they also don't necessarily keep the knowledge in the university. One can argue that they exchange knowledge and they bring new knowledge to other universities, but a 
a lot of them decide to exit the research career path altogether because of casualization, because of more and more of them being in serial postdoc positions. Some have argued that this is a gendered pattern that we see. We see that women are in postdoc positions more than men are. They're more in the casual positions, in the contract positions. I will show you results that shows the opposite. There's a recent deceleration in the growth of postdocs, as we saw in the first slide, which makes me wonder, is it maybe also because of a decline in the growth in international postdocs? And Alexi Asmus in uh, 1993 wrote a very interesting piece on the creation of postdoctoral fellowships and the citing of American scientific research. And we he mentions that in the 1920s, American postdoctoral fellowships were often used by their recipients to study in Europe. And I thought this was a nice quote as well, because they did so because they wanted to acquire knowledge of theory and of quantum science, in both of which the American universities were relatively weak. So they left. They left the um, American universities and they went overseas to, to Europe and then sometimes came back with the new knowledge. That made me ask, what about South African postdocs? What percentages are not South African nationals over time? And we have a relatively small survey that gave us an average from 2005 to 2010 of 63%. And then we had better data for a few years from the R&D surveys, the green, which shows us uh, an up to, upward trend, 54% are not South African nationals. So never in the history of postdocs in South Africa have South African nationals been the majority of postdocs, always been non-South Africans. And we can see it's been relatively stable that last, the last few gray bars are the ones that uh, we got from the institutional data. The average is around 62 63% has been and will be, I uh, think, in future. Well, um, Nature conducted a global survey of postdocs of its readers um, in 2020 and again in 2023. One of the questions was, are you undertaking your postdoctoral fellowship in your native con country or not? And it's so interesting to see that 61% of the respondents, very close to our 62 and 63 average, said they are not conducting it in their native country. So we're not that different in terms of our national profile of postdocs. However, looking at the NRF funding of South African and foreign postdocs, we see a different picture. Now, I have to warn you, and that's the footnote at the bottom, that, and it was quite a surprise for me, that only 17% of postdocs at universities are funded by the NRF. I checked the data again and again. But amongst that 17%, we had, well, 62% were funded by the NRF, um, were foreign postdocs that were funded by the NRF. In 2022, we now have only 48% of them being funded by the NRF. So you can see a clear trend in a decline of the postdocs in South Africa that are not South African nationals being funded by the NRF. The NRF has a new funding policy, which I will say something about later if there's time. Even more surprising, I found, was the change in the percentage of foreign postdocs, country of birth, sorry, should say country of birth. And we use the institutional data for this. So we're now taking that 62 or so percent over the six or so years, and we're saying, okay, what percentage is rest of Africa? That's the green, and what percentage is rest of the world? So you can see that Postdocs from the rest of Africa have increased really amazingly since 2016. In 2016, they comprised 45% of the foreign postdocs. In 2022, they comprised 78% of the postdocs. Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and Cameroon are the three most common 
countries from which postdocs come or the nationalities that we um, that we get uh, in South Africa as postdocs. And amongst those in the rest of the world, it's India, Great Britain, and France. By race, we can see that there has been a decrease in the percentage of postdocs that are white, but they still comprise the majority if one divides the population groups into four, and there's been an increase in the percentage of black postdocs, of black African postdocs for the other two population groups, the situation has remained relatively stable. Now the one around women, it's gonna be a bit of a spaghetti, <laughs> but what it's trying to tell you is the green line tells you what's been going on with um, woman's percentage as postdocs. So that's the green line. We started off at 44%. Of all postdocs, 44% are women. So it is a minority. We ended, ended up at 42%, but we've gone up and down a lot. All right. But it does look like there's a slight decrease if we take it from 42, 44 to 42. At the same time, the blue line, which is women amongst researchers with a PhD, has increased quite a lot, much more. And the percentage of women among doctoral graduates has remained relatively stable with the postdocs. And um, they're very close to each other, all three. It does not seem as if there is a leak in the pipeline from PhD to postdoc or from postdoc to um, women amongst researchers with a PhD. We surmise in the SHAS article that women might have an easier, might have an easier way into these permanent positions, researchers with a PhD, and do not have to do a postdoc because of labor legislation. And that men end up doing postdocs more often than women do because they cannot get into those permanent positions. But we still need a lot more data. What we do know is that for the countries that we have comparable data, Canada and the USA, completely different countries, uh, we, we see um, a much more steady growth of women amongst postdocs than we see in South Africa. In South Africa, it's almost flatline, if not a slight decrease over time. But you has to ask yourself, is this a good or a bad thing? Depends on where they go if they're not doing postdocs. If they go into permanent positions straight from the PhD much more often than men do, then it's not a negative. Asmus further says that postdoctoral fellowships contributed in America, again around the 1920s, but also he writes about just after the Second World War, to raising the standard of research in American universities. They increased the amount of research done at universities. A lot of these universities were teaching universities. In doing so, they made research a normal component of the activities of a university. So postdocs have that positive effect. So it's quite important to ask ourselves, what is the distribution of postdocs amongst universities? Now, this is where Popia comes in. We collected data on institutions saying to the institutions that we will not we will not mention the institutions by name, especially if it might embarrass the institutions. So I'm limited in the, you know, saying to you, Stellenbosch has more postdocs than bits, and UJ has the most postdocs in the country. I, I can't do that, unfortunately. So I had to do quite a lot of other things. I can at least tell you what the range is of the permanent staff per postdoc. At one university in South Africa, for every three permanent staff members, there's one postdoc. And at another university on the end of the scale, for every 76 staff members permanent, there's one postdoc. The mean is around seven. Now we've been working on a, an index of research intensity of universities to be able to categorize them and use them in our analyses to compare groups of universities with each other. We find that the distinction between traditional, comprehensive, and universities of technology don't quite work for us. 
So we look at, for instance, the article output of universities per staff uh, with PhDs, uh, the PhD output per staff with PhDs. We use all the data that we possibly have that could show research intensity, and we try and put those together. So I thought, what is, what if I work them into, well, they, most of them are in ratio form, and I compare a final index, which is a ratio, with the ratio of postdocs and see if there's a relationship. And there is, I still have to work out what the correlation is. But um, especially here at the, the top end where you have relatively high research intensity and relatively high numbers of postdocs per staff, um, there you get a, a re relatively strong relationship between research intensity and postdocs. Of course, we don't know what caused what. We, it's a chicken egg problem at this stage. Um, it could be that the research intensive universities are attracting the postdocs. It could be that the postdocs are making them more research intensive, as Asma said. I can at least, I think I won't be in trouble yeah. I can at least say that the top universities there in terms of research intensity and um, ratio of postdocs. In other words, those with the highest number of postdocs equal bits. Free State, Pretoria, Stellenbosch, Rhodes, UCT, and UJ. And those of you who read the SHAS article will probably know which one, uh, uh, well, yeah, which one is the one that's top university in terms of postdocs per staff. Um, all right, so that brings us to the survey results. And I just want to remind you by showing you some a profile of the survey respondents, just remind you who are we talking about here when we're looking at the survey results. Eight of the universities hosted 5% or more, up to 20% of the respondents. UP had a very high response rate because they um, made sure that all their postdocs answered the questionnaire. They did it themselves. The other universities allowed us to send out the questionnaire and I didn't have the manpower all the time to do the kind of intensive work that they did at their campus. They used the survey, our questionnaire also for their own purposes. So we had a good relationship there and a good agreement. So the the, the same universities, give or take maybe one or two differences, um, are also those eight universities. So it's UP, UJ, UCT, Stellenbosch, Free State, Rhodes, UNISA, and WITS. UNISA did not provide us with institutional data. Unfortunately, that's why they're here, but they're not in the other analyses. Also, five universities postdocs did not participate. In science, terms of science domains, most of the postdocs classified their postdoc work in the natural sciences, then the social sciences, followed by the health sciences. We find in the smallest categories, economic and management sciences, but also engineering sciences and applied technologies, which I think sometimes fits very well with what Nithex does. But I also looked a little bit at the, the disciplines that the uh, postdocs gave us the raw data and looked at this circle and found that um, a relatively small percentage, mostly fall within the, the natural sciences, um, are in this group. So we have natural sciences, but it's, uh, yeah, uh, they, they're they the largest group, but um, they're not necessarily um, all within theoretical physics or computational science, et cetera. The number of postdoc positions that the postdocs had complete uh, has had taken since completing their PhD well one two three four five we asked them and 75 percent said well I'm busy with my first postdoc so that's the standard but there were a number of the respondents that were in their second postdoc some in their third and some in their fourth or fifth a very small percentage though and most of you would say yes but the NRF doesn't allow you to have two postdoc, more than two in a row, as far as I remember. And, uh, but then again, the NRF only funds less than one in five postdocs at South African universities. Why are they taking the postdoc position? These options were given to them, so they're not from the qualitative data, but um, the top answer was future employment enhancement, followed by developing the research portfolio, developing research skills. So it's the standard reasons why Postdocs actually exist. There is on the It's a really, really 
um, good match with, I think, the definition at the beginning, except for unable to find a different suitable position. 15% of them. I don't think the American uh, Universities Committee included that in their definition. Postdocs are for those unable to find a different suitable position. Um, and now we get to what we call the serial postdoc. They are different names for it but we'll keep to the serial postdoc that's the postdoc that does more than one postdoc in a row without getting any permanent job and we asked how many years had they been in postdoc positions by the end of 2021 not yeah it is it is quite concerning that some of them have been in postdoc positions for four five six years i've highlighted those there uh relatively large percentages still that we need to worry about. Um, the others are probably anomalies that we don't have to be too concerned about. For 78% of those, these are now only the postdocs who've had more than one position since the PhD. It's for 78% poor job prospects led them to holding more than one postdoc position. So that's the reason. It's not because they like being postdocs. It's not because they want to take a second position. It's because they can't find other jobs. So more figures. The average year-on-year -year increase in numbers, 2007 to 2021. Let's look at this. PhD graduates grew by 8% year-on-year on average. Postdocs grew by 12%. Lecturers by? 2%. Lecturers include junior lecturers, lecturers, and senior lecturers. The posts that postdocs can be expected to move into when they have finished their postdoc position, 2%. And here I quote Johan Moton, actually, so I should give him credit here. The absorptive capacity of universities to employ PhD graduates and postdocs has reached a point of saturation. We found this to again apply to our data he already said that about the PhD tracer study, which you can also find on Crest's website, where we trace the careers of PhDs. And the person who did most of the analysis is sitting here today as well. And you can maybe talk to her later about the PhD tracer study. And we need to also look at the policy that's causing this. So we've got the National Development Plan's target of producing more than 100 doctoral graduates per 1 million of the population by 2030. And we we really tried our best. You can see that. We are creating PhD graduates, and they have been increasing, especially since 2009. At the same time, though, things started going a bit... Uh, wrong, if I can use that term, um, and with regards to the financing of the higher education system after fees must fall. So there were budget cuts that were quite severe, uh, and they were the, the, the cuts were in research funding and support, because somewhere money had to come from to address the issues that were raised by the fees must fall movement. It's one of the reasons. One of my PhD students also did uh, research on this issue, the investment by business in R&D. In 2020, it was at its lowest level since 2001. So to expect postdocs to go into the business sector after they finished training that prepared them for an academic career is perhaps unrealistic. Again, the same point. It's about market and supply. At the same time, the DST is aware of this, but says, this is a solution. We've got an increased PhD output. We can't really put them anywhere. Let's increase postdoc fellowships, which I think is not the solution because all you do is you're just increasing that casualization of labor. They get, they're becoming older. They're staying in the postdoc positions longer. We're not the only country with this problem. So there's been a large OECD funded study done on this issue, and um, I was on uh, one of the uh, one of the members of the of the study, and um, it was amazing to just hear how everywhere across the world this is an issue. South Africa has its specific challenges, specifically interesting funding policy changes that have been happening, which is the topic of my next set of slides. As I mentioned before. On average, the NRF in the past few years has funded only about 17% of postdocs at universities. It 
looked okay at the beginning. It was 17%, 18%, 17%, 19%. And here you can see where the revised budget started coming in, 14%. But we went up at least to 15 again. Um, but I don't think we're going to get again to 19%. So my one colleague, Francois van Skalkwijk, Dr. van Skalkwijk, he is analyzing uh, the institutional data. Um, he said he, not quite sure, but he thinks at least in 2022, the institutions funded approximately 46% of the postdocs. So what we are seeing is that the institutions themselves are getting money from somewhere because the NRF is reducing its funding, and they are appointing postdocs with that funding. We need to find the data on what the sources of funding are other than the NRF. And we don't have much of um, much data on that. How much do postdocs earn? Well, in 2022, 10% earned less than 200,000 per annum. Now this is then um, tax-free. It's quite a, quite a low amount. Try and do the maths divided by 12. Then most of them earned around 200 to 299,000 per annum. And so the percentages go down as one goes up on the scale. It aligns with the NRS funding per annum, which is on average or has been for the past few years, 200,000. It's nice to read in the most recent NRF performance plan that they recognize that the funding of postdocs has remained stagnant from 2021. And in their most recent framework, funding framework for their postdocs at universities, they said they adjusted the postdoc stipend to 320k. So they realized that postdocs have been left behind while the amount of funding for postgraduate students increased. But the number of fellowships, I think, that they are then able to fund also decreases. There are no statistically dif significant differences amongst fields or domain. We tried to test for uh, where it made theoretically sense to test for differences. The health sciences slightly more likely to be in the higher income categories. That's all the data show, but I, I don't really want to put my head on a block there on that. The respondent said that the income is inadequate. Close, for close to 60%, it was inadequate. 78% said they were completely unable to save what they wanted to save. The qualitative data was quite difficult to read sometimes. There were at least 80 um, comments that were very negative about the low remuneration. Um, and some postdocs gave extra information and said, you are shooting yourself in the foot it limits the attractiveness of postdoc positions. We're not going to go for those positions anymore. And it has a very negative uh, effect on the wellness of postdocs, uh, those with families to support, et cetera. For more detail on these, um, yes, I hope I can make available a book sooner or later on this. But I do have a report if somebody is interested. And there's variation in remuneration, which causes a lot of bad faith. So there are postdocs that um, know about other postdocs at the institution that earn twice as much as them, and they don't really do different work. So it's very much dependent on the funding of the supervisor as well, and that causes great frustration amongst postdocs. Reliability of payment, more than a fifth did not receive their payment in a reliable manner. And uh, some of the reasons are delays in visa approvals. So they're suddenly without an income because they can't come here and they're not going to get paid. Inadequate funding, suddenly the funding runs, runs out of the supervisor and therefore the postdoc is without an income. Poor communication on regulations where the postdoc is allowed to work and how many hours they're allowed to work on other 
aspects. For instance, teaching. They do more than a certain number of hours of teaching and they're on an NRF funded scholarship or a fellowship, then they um, then they don't get paid because they've contravened the rules of their agreement with the NRF. And some postdocs are just not aware of that or the institutions don't make them aware of that. More than a third did not receive their remuneration monthly. And for two thirds of those, it posed challenges not to receive remuneration monthly. We asked them if you had a choice, would you keep your tax exempt status? You do know that postdocs in South Africa don't pay tax. 45% said yes, they would keep their tax exempt status. It means they get paid more than if they had to pay tax, uh, but they realize that that doesn't give them access to benefits. But 40% would change their status if they had the choice to a tax-paying employee. So since the 19, well, late 1990s, when Wieland Gevers at UCT started postdocs at UCT as an institution, this whole idea of their tax-exempt status has been um, institutionalized for so many years. Um, and we thought we'd just ask, is everybody happy with this situation? 15% were unsure. It is a difficult call to make, I suppose, for some. But having a tax-exempt status, limited access to financial products and services, you can't get a cell phone contract. You can't, you struggle to get um, uh, access to a loan. Uh, even to rent accommodation is a problem sometimes without proof of um, a full-on employment and a tax-paying employment. And they also said it made them feel like a student. They are also treated like students by host institutions. This caused a lot of negative feedback in, in the in, that we got in the survey, um, is that host institutions especially the administrative staff and the management staff, do not know what a postdoc is and do not know how to treat the postdoc. And there are no systems in which a postdoc um, can fit. So, you know, invitations would go out to presentations such as this, but the postdocs would not be included because they're not on the staff. Um, but the students would be included. The postdocs sometimes fall between the cracks. So it is a broader issue of concern in sociology and social anthropology, we call it liminality. Um, so that's when you're in between two institutionalized statuses. You're not yet permanent staff member, you're not yet staff, but you're no longer a student. What are you and how should you be treated? Yes, so they do not get employment benefits. Just to give you an idea of how few of them actually do get benefits, the most basic benefit, which is paid vacation or annual leave and paid sick leave, was reported by less than 20% of the postdocs. It's especially the medical insurance that was an issue, especially those with families. And again, the lack of standardization uh, regarding the way institutions treat their postdocs. Some institutions pay for postdocs research costs, such as going to conferences, and then others do not. And the postdocs talk amongst themselves at the conferences, and they find out that they had to pay for their own conference attendance while their friend from another institution didn't. And this causes animosity. So we would recommend, of course, standardization of income and of these other financial incentives. And it's nice to see, as I said, in the NRF annual performance plan that some of what we've uh, already said has been taken up by the NRF. There's recognition of the variation in the value of the postdoc fellowships. At least then the NRF is aware of this and they do recognize the need for standardization. I don't know when they will um, let us know how they're going to standardize the income. Um, and as I said, the host institutions could also be a little bit more standard. Now, that's where my friend, Dr. Van Skolkweg, also comes in. He did um, some policy dialogues amongst the universities in South Africa and went to them and talked to them about the possibility of a standardized 
policy for institutions on how to treat postdocs at universities, giving freedom for universities to wiggle within that, um, or at least then an agreement that we try and do things the same way across institutions when it comes to important things such as finances. So they, the increase has already happened, at least from the NRF side, to match the rising cost of living and inflation that I think we're all aware of. And postdocs feel that it should also match what they're able to do and what they actually do as well. A monthly income is also something that is really a minimum requirement, I would say. Strangely enough, longer postdoctoral contracts were called for, especially for those who only have one-year contracts and come from other countries. It's a nightmare for them in terms of their visa applications, and they find that they struggle to get a publication out of you know, their research within that one year, let alone two or three publications, which brings us to the publication output of postdocs in the last few minutes. So most 80% of the postdocs were required always formally, to produce a certain number of journal articles, mostly two articles, maybe one article, in some cases, some ridiculous amounts. Um, but again, maybe just anomalies in the data that we should maybe again check. And the output of postdocs compared with the number of postdocs in the system. This is the article, the journal articles that have been published show us that uh, around 2017, the barrier was broken of one publication per postdoc. Uh, we now at 1.75. There has been an exponential increase here in the output of postdocs at our universities. And uh, maybe I shouldn't use the word exponential if it's not exponential. This is where the new research outputs policy came into effect, which increased the number of um, journals that were recognized for subsidy by increasing, by adding scopus, et cetera, and also the amount per journal article publication was increased quite a lot. And it worked as an incentive, not only for permanent academic staff, but for postdocs as well. Postdocs feel like the purple one in the middle. Requirements are somewhat unrealistic. They're struggling to get to that two outputs per, um, per annum. They have work role conflict and delays in feedback from co-authors uh, during the peer review process, which we all, I think, deal with, but we don't have only one or two years in which to finalize and you know a, a publication. So it creates uh, more problems for them. I go on maybe a little bit more supervision of students. Seventy-three percent were allowed to at least co-supervise. Fifty-four had actually contributed. What's problematic is they're not formally acknowledged for that contribution. They're not on the thesis or the dissertation. But almost 90% were sure that they wanted to supervise master students. And here is where we found statistically significant differences amongst at least the two major groups or my, main science domains. So we find that um, those in the STEM fields are not as often formally acknowledged for their supervision as those in the social sciences and humanities. And those in the STEM field are also more likely than postdocs in the social sciences and humanities to want to supervise post uh, master students. But it's a, it's a really large percentage. I, when I looked again at the definition of postdocs, I said to myself, but it doesn't say, and what we you know will supervise masters and PhD students. That's not the idea of a postdoc, but it has become the idea of a postdoc, especially for for postdocs who want badly to have an academic position. And they know that if they have this on their CV, that they've supervised more as the students, that it would help them and give them a foot in the door. 58% were allowed to at least co-supervise PhD students. It's quite a lot, but uh, very few actually did so, um, less than a third. 
and less than half of them were always formally acknowledged. Again, that problem. Again, a very high percentage who were sure that they wanted to supervise PhD students. But I think the last two subjects I will have to leave for another time so that we do have a little bit of time to interact and, and have questions. I've stolen five minutes. Thank you very much. Very much prepared. Really interesting insights in the uh, postdoc uh, environment. I just want to Hi, I'm Jurita Holbrook. I'm visiting from Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. I wonder what's the impact of COVID? I mean, you have all these 2020, 2021 data. We, we did not see much of an impact of COVID. We did ask in, well, it came up in the uh, qualitative data, but we did not see any dip in trends, output or anything like that. No. Um, but some mentioned, four or five mentioned in the qualitative data had caused problems with their research. But it seems that, uh, no, it wasn't a major issue. But thanks for asking, yeah. Hi, I was wondering what kind of percentage of PhD graduates actually go on to do postdocs? A third. About a third. But oh. In South Africa. So the data I'm now remembering is from the PhD tracer study, which looked at the PhD graduates from South African universities over the last 18 years. Well, it was from 2000 to 2018. And amongst those, we we asked, did you do a postdoc? And a third said, yes, they did do a postdoc. So, no. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Thank you for the talk. Um, when you had the graph showing the the distribution of non, I think it was African or or postdocs from African countries and non African countries. Yeah, rest of the world and rest of Africa. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there any indication why there's been such a large, you know, an increase in 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 postdocs from from rest of Africa? Yeah, yeah, and decrease in. Or Looking at Milandre, um, we we have been picking up on the fact that uh, Africa is increasingly the hub of PhD training for PhD students. We get a huge influx of students, PhD students coming here. And then they, if they do get a postdoc, they stay on. And I think that's what we're seeing here. So I'm quoting Nico Kluter's book uh, where he said, uh, uh, and, and papers where we refers to Africa as the hub of, of PhD training. And it's now becoming the hub of postdoc training, it seems. Um, could it be that the higher education institutions in the rest of Africa are just not providing to those students the um, training that they need? They might not have the, uh, yeah, the PhD supervisors even in certain fields that they need. So there are a number of reasons why why they come to South Africa. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Just a follow-up question on that. Uh, well, what, what what I actually find a little bit not confusing, but maybe strange, is that the number of postdocs from the rest of the world is dec decreasing so quickly. Could that actually be a sign that the South African system is no longer attractive to the world? That is, oh, and then that would that really be qualitative if, uh, in, in problem, I think. Yeah, it's a, it's one interpretation that that we'll be looking at. Um, it, seems like but the whole policy situation the whole the whole policy the discourse has become more about local it's become more nationalist i've actually got one of my last slides but i now see for some other reason i'm stuck on this one now. but there's a last slide that i wanted to show you also about the perception that um that we are you know not not a place where people feel welcome in south africa so there are many reasons for that. But the yeah, I would say the two most important reasons would be that we have uh, we have lost our attractiveness, as you said. But also the funding. There's no more funding available for international postdocs to come here. The funding 
it's being kept for the South African postdocs. Questions online. Hello. Okay, there's a question here from Oswin Dine Marunga. Is there a good reason why postdocs are treated as students? Is it for tax purposes? Uh, yes, it's it's a result of being um, paid in a tax with a tax free stipend that you then are treated as a student. I would say that is one of the main reasons why postdocs feel that they actually want to pay tax so that the status can change at institutions. Thanks. Um, yes, thank you, Heidi. I just wanted to maybe mention something about um, sort of the rest of African postdocs. We also saw in this, we saw in the Tracer study that many academics in African universities have a position as a lecturer, but then they take a sabbatical to come and do a postdoc in South Africa. So we see many postdocs already employed in African institutions, but they come do a postdoc, um, you know, for various reasons. Um, but then Heidi, I just had a question, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but looking at the gender um the gender of postdocs. You said that we've in in your study, um, you expected a higher percentage of women postdocs than than the results showed, and I wondered if you controlled for discipline in that, um, because you know in this you, we saw that then disciplines in the STEM sciences a postdoc is more, um, often done in the STEM sciences and the social sciences, and I wondered if the represent represent representativeness of males and females across disciplines maybe accounted for. Oh, excellent. No, we uh, haven't yet done that. We haven't controlled for for discipline there. So I will do that. Yes, thanks, Milandre. Yeah. I will be at your office <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Um, it might also the first point you made might also explain some of the increase in the age groups, whether the older age groups. Um, so we're seeing more and more established lecturers taking a sabbatical and coming to South Africa for further training in the form of a postdoc. Thank you for that. There are no more urgent questions than Heidi. Thank you so much again for a very interesting. interesting talk. And I think this is the discussion that will go on. <laughs> and we will invite you again when the book is ready <laughs> or published. <laughs>